Hi, everyone. I'm Ivan Bayuki, and welcome back to Wall Street Silver. Our guest today is Lawrence Lepard. He is an investment manager, sound money advocate, and a gold stock fund manager. Welcome back, sir. Thank you very much. Good to see you, Ivan. Good to see you, Jim. It's always fun to be with you guys. Well, he's not just a gold guy. He's also a, a silver bug like us. And so <laughs> Big time. I'd, be I'd be remiss if I didn't start off with the silver chart here, Lawrence. Um, yeah. It seems like, you know, we, we had this huge set off going back a long ways. You know, we were up in the mid 20s for a long time and it was just a brutal time period, uh, you know, all spring and summer down to 18. But what do you think? Is it was 18 the bottom? Are we turning the corner here? What's your take? I, I believe it is, Jim. I think we're sold out. I mean, that was kind of a Elliott Wave ABC correction. And uh, as you know, these metals look ahead and the Fed hasn't pivoted yet, but the, the metals are smelling it. And uh, and it just it couldn't get more oversold. I tweeted something this morning about the sentiment in, you know, bullish percentage of gold miners. It hadn't been as low as it is right now. Um, until or since uh, March of 2020, the bottom of March 2020. And anybody who bought gold mining stocks in March 2020 felt really good about it six months, a year, year and a half later. And I think that's what's going to happen here. Lawrence, here's this tweet you made. Walk us through what you're trying yeah, to Yeah, so what this is, is this, just a, this is a chart where they measure the, the gold miner bullish percentage index. I think they're, um, you know, it, it's a sentiment measure, right? And so at the, at the, hop, at the top of this, uh, schedule, you know, when you're up around 100, that means pretty much everybody's bullish on gold miners, and I think they measure it based on looking at prices relative to 200-day moving average and so forth. But anyway, and at the bottom, you know, just the opposite is true. They're really sold out, and um, you know, the last there, bottom, the, yeah, yeah, the last bottom this low. I mean, there were a couple of bottoms before this, but it was March. Yeah, exactly. You're pointing to it. March 2020. That was COVID hit. Everything got smashed. It was a correlation of one. Everything just sold off super hard, and you know, we're back to there. And uh, if you then, I didn't put it up here, but I, if anyone goes and looks at the chart of, you know, gold or gold miners or silver, you know, put in put in the GDX from March to present, right? Yes, I mean, yeah. or, or silver. Yeah, perfect example. Here, here's the silver uh, chart for back. Yeah, then. right. So in, in, mm. in we went from you know, in, in March 12, of- uh, 12 to yeah. 30 after that. <laughs> exactly. I mean, and it, it's funny, I, I, I know that 12 very well because I had some silver on margin I have a deposit, a place where I've deposited my silver and they give me a very low interest rate. So I borrow against it sometimes. And I got a, <laughs> I got a call from, it's a big depository. I mean, it's, it's thousands of ounces that I have. And the guy called me up. He said, um, you need to wire me $150,000 in the next 24 <laughs> hours. I'm going to blow you out. <laughs> and, and I said, okay, uh, do not blow me out. The wire's on its way. <laughs> you know? Oh, wow. went, yeah and then and then you look at uh gold same same story right yeah. that was it was a very good time to be buying those things and and so we're at that same kind of sentiment and obviously this is just contrarian analysis that you know when things are that bombed out um you know typically uh, coming out the other side of it, it can be pretty good and you know we didn't talk we talked a little before the, we got on the on this video um you know gold peaked at 19 in 2011 at 1900 gold peaked in uh um you know, in early 2020, August of 2020, you know, also, yeah, you can see that 2070, yeah, going way back. And then, um, and then earlier this year, it was, it was high as well. Um, and, and so we kind of got like the triple top and there really are, there's no such thing as a triple top. And so, so when gold takes out this 2060, 2070 level, mm -hmm. it's going to be an all time high cat, you know, territory and the algos are going to kick in and we're going to squirt up to 2,500, 3,000 before you know what hit us. And, yeah, well, the I, last I, time it was so, you know, just to go back to your sentiment indicator. Yeah. The, so we're at the same level sentiment wise as we are for March 2020. But yes. I want to point out it was down at 1400 back then. Mm -hmm. Correct. The run, was, the run went from 1400 up to 2000. Right. So we're at the same level of sold off sentiment right now, but we're we're sitting here three or four hundred dollars per per ounce higher exactly with the massive sell-off and sentiment so if it takes off and runs back up you gotta think, I think it, you gotta I think, think it's coming way up here absolutely i mean i think 2300 is a slam dunk and right a lot of the technical guys i look at think we, we hit 25 and who knows we could hit three but you know the the thing that i we're going to talk about jim is that you know and, and ivan that, that you know the stocks i've invested in the companies i own i mean because of this battered gold stock bull syndrome which i is what i coined you, know, you have to be a masochist to be in this area, right? Because you have these incredibly good years, and then you just get the shit kicked out of you. 
um, you know, be, because you know when, when these th these things work at today's prices. I mean, I have a I have a basket of portfolio companies that are trading at you know three times cash flow, four times cash flow. Mm -hmm. uh, one I looked at today was at two times cash flow. So, you know, that's cheap. I mean, Apple is selling at thirty times cash flow. Oh yeah. So, you know, and 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 that's at today's metals prices. I mean, if you take as we all know, there's a lot of operating levers in this business. You take the metal price up. You know, the costs are going to go up for sure. Diesel's going up, et cetera. Inputs are going up, but not as fast as the metal would go. And so you're going to have really serious earnings growth and then, or cash flow growth. And then, you know, apply a bigger multiple to a bigger cash flow number. This is how you achieve three baggers, six baggers, 10 baggers. Yeah, that's a good point to make is um, a lot of the the major producers, you know, even at these, these companies are built to make money at $1,200 an ounce gold. And, well barely <laughs> yeah. yeah but but a lot of them are, are you know even even at 1700 1800 gold where we are right now a lot of these companies are still making crazy money i mean they were making oh, even absolutely. more crazy money at 1900 two thousand dollars an ounce but at seven at 1800 where we're not where we are, you know we're just below i mean uh, if, if you know look if you go to 2500 dollars gold you know most of these guys have a margin of about 600 bucks an ounce yeah. And so if you go from 18 to 25, you're adding another, you know, 700 bucks an ounce. So basically you're saying you're going to double the profits of a lot of these companies. Well, and, and a lot of them have paid down all their debt in the past. Oh, yeah. Years. Yeah. And no, it's, they just have bulletproof. Yeah. The discipline. Right I mean, they all learned from the last bear market. I mean, all the bad guys got sorted out. And, you know, and, and in fact, arguably, everybody's being too conservative because they're all looking in the rearview mirror going, this is a really tough business. Yeah. And and of course. So ironically, that's when sometimes it becomes a very easy business. It's about to become a very easy business. And yeah. so, um, so, so what's know. the next pivot that people are looking for? Are you want, you know, the big debate well, that we see on Twitter these days is will the, you know, it's the bond guys versus the macro, you know, everyone's wondering, oh, the Fed's going to pivot. The Fed, they can't, they can't keep raising rates. And then the, some of the, a lot of the bond guys are like, oh, oh they're going to fight inflation. You got to <laughs> the Fed. The Fed has total credibility. It's like, yeah, where, do it's, come, where do you come in this in this debate? Yeah, right now? you know, I, I've given up trying to do the short term projections and the, you know, the the week and day and month. And but I do look at the I, I try to focus on the big theme and the big picture. And I tell my investors, I say, look, I can't tell you if we're going to have a good three months, six months, nine months, but I'm pretty sure we're going to have a good three years. And the reason for that is that if you look at the underlying macro conditions that we're in, where we've got too much debt. And it's either going to default, in which case gold and silver will benefit because they're sound money, or it's going to be inflated away, in which case gold and silver will benefit because inflation you know, benefits these things. One of those two things is going to cause us to win and win big time. I mean, this is going to look a lot like the 70s. And you know, inflation could wax and wane. And we got a big inflation print coming tomorrow. It'll probably be down from the 9-1. So what? You know, inflation could come in a good bit, but but you know we're not going back to a 2% inflation world. That's just a fact. Things have changed. We've got a shortage of a lot of things. We've got war conditions. We've got you know the COVID supply line issues, et cetera. And we've now changed into an inflationary psychology, which will be very hard to stop. Mm -hmm. So with that as a backdrop, this period, in my opinion, is going to look very much like the 1970s, where you're going to have kind of waves of inflation. Sometimes it'll be hot. Sometimes it'll cool down. But and and the government, you know, and the Fed will try and fight it. They'll raise rates, but guess what? And they'll have a big recession. Something will break, and they'll have to chop rates and print again. And I think what's going on, and it's so important for our thesis, is that more and more people are coming to realize that these people are trapped and that they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and so, <laughs> if you're if you're if you're trapped and you don't know what you're doing, you know, you 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 waver around. I, as I've said, you, you're driving a clown car between inflation and deflation. And our stuff is going to do well because it's not dependent. You know, it's it's outside of their system. Their mm -hmm. fiat system is broken. Our stuff is not broken. It can't be printed. So we're going to be fine, but we do need to be, we do need to have perspective. And it's hard because people look at say, hey, inflation's raging. How come gold and silver aren't going up? I said, well, they did go up quite a bit. I mean, in 18, 2018, it was at 1365. It went to 2000. That was one hell of a move. And, and ironically, what these things tend to do, in, in my observation, having done this since 08, is they tend to look around the corner and see it in advance. So the Fed hasn't pivoted yet, but mm -hmm. gold and silver are rallying. What I think is going on, I think gold and silver smell it. They know the, they know the right. Fed's going to have to pivot. You know, could it be this fall? Could it be a Jackson? I mean, it could be a Jackson Hole next month. But frankly, it could be a next March. 
don't think it matters. I think, you know, I think the fact is that, you know, they'll get a recession, unemployment will become the bigger issue. And at that point in time, you know, people will be hurting and, you know, they're going to soften up. And it's not just the Fed. I mean, that's a lot of people point to the Fed and say, well, that's that's the entire game. Well, that's a piece of the game. The other piece is the federal government, you know, and, and what they spend and what they do. And as you guys know, we just had the, you know, the Orwellian, you know, inflation control. <laughs> inflation, inflation or, yeah, right? We're going to spend a bunch of money to control inflation. And, you know, I, I often told investors who were looking at my fund, I said, look, you know, the, the thing, my fund won't work if the federal government gets really responsible. And of course, they all laughed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if they stop spending, raise taxes, you know, means test the Social Security, et cetera, you know, because as we know, Washington's broken and they can't stop. They just can't. Yeah. And that's that's really the driver. I mean, the Fed, sadly, I mean, I don't like them. I feel no sympathy for them because they're bad people. But the Fed is just, you know, they're just trying to do everything they can to keep the system together. Yeah. You got you to gotta look at it from a, they're not trying to do what's right. They're just trying to kick the can to prevent it from breaking the day when they're there. Yeah. And 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 at the end of the day, what that'll mean is that they'll do what Nixon did. That You know, they'll continually, they'll just keep changing the rules and making the money less valuable over time. And the money we have, gold and silver, is 5,000-year-old money, and you can't print it. So, you know, and even in a deflationary environment, I mean, if you think about deflation, what do you want to hold? You want to you want to have cash in a deflationary environment because prices would be going down. And perhaps we have deflation. Perhaps they'll be really tough and he'll be Volcker. And perhaps prices will go down. So what do you want to hold in deflation? I know because my grandfather did it in the 30s. You want to have cash. The reason you want to have cash is your buying power goes up. You know, if everything you're buying gets cheaper, in a deflationary environment, cash is a good thing. Well, what are gold and silver? They are cash that can't be printed. Mm -hmm. So right. they're the best form of cash, yeah. right? So even in a deflationary environment, we're going to be okay, guys. I mean, this is this is really the only place to be. And people say, well, you know, it's been rocky. Why don't you get out of it? I'm like, well, and go where? You know, <laughs> I mean, go buy Apple at 30 times earnings. You know, yeah. go chase a real estate that's been, you know, a complete bubbly environment. I mean, you know, there's really no place else to go. So right. in my opinion, you know, the it, it's a rough ride, but you got you got to have your hand on the tiller and realize we're in a storm and just like, OK, you know, I mean, and, and gold, you know, obviously it came off its highs. But, you know, to be honest with you, when you consider how much they've started to push up rates and how much they slowed down the growth of M2 and all the things, how, how strong the dollar has been relative to other currencies. I'm kind of surprised gold has hang, hung in there as well as it has. Yeah. Up until now, the past 30, 40 years, we've had so many macroeconomic items that have been pushing down inflation, you know, whether it's outsourcing right. to China, China, whether it's bringing in immigration nonstop from, you know, Central and South America to drive down service sector wages shale oil you know we, we suddenly shale we got oil. a bunch of oil that we didn't realize we had right yeah. so yeah. there have been a lot of macroeconomic factors that have are you know kept inflation down and we got used to that thinking it's permanent yes and now a lot of those things are reversing where yes. you know this we had this chips bill that's going to bring all sorts of computer chip manufacturing subsidize it to make so that they're encouraged to build these factories in the united states um that's just one of many factors that's changing yeah and maybe building in you know so i'm wondering whether you're what you said earlier about inflation not going back to two percent if if these factors that kept it so artificially low for so long are disappearing that might be the case where two percent is just not achievable anymore that's how i see it jim i, I completely agree with you i mean we underinvested in all these commodities and resources you know, we got way out over our skis in terms of expecting these supply lines to not have any problems and COVID kind of blew a hole in that. And and it's also an energy story. I mean, it's really, a, you know, we, we tapped, I mean, we, we got very lucky in the last 10 years with the shale oil and, and all this gas that we were able to find in the United States. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it really saved our bacon. But as, as people in the shale industry will tell you, you know, the easy stuff's been done. Now, you know, maybe maybe some others in other parts of the world will find more. I mean, there's been talk about you know, the Argentinian shale and so forth. So, you know, it's possible that, that the, you know, oil prices aren't going higher, but, you know, it, it, we're not going back to a deflationary world with oil in the $80, $90 a barrel area. It's just not going to happen. You know, I, I know good oil analysts who think 140, 150, 200 
or in the cards sometime in the next few years. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you know, that's that's just a different world. It's just a really different world. Yeah. Well, Europe, Europe has a lot of shale, uh, shale gas right. under, in, in European uh, Eurozone areas, but they, they, they won't frack for anything. So oh, really? it's, it, yeah. they, they will never drill it, no matter yeah. how bad. I, I don't think they even acknowledge to their population that it's there. They're so right. afraid. <laughs> but, uh, I, was, I wasn't aware of that. I mean, I know they shut down the coal plants. They shut down the nuclear. I mean, it's yeah. really tragic. You know, that this 13 year old named Greta, how dare you? You know, basically got a bunch <laughs> of adults thinking the wrong way about hydrocarbons, which are absolutely essential to modern life and can be managed, and nuclear can be managed. But yeah, that's an entirely different political subject. I mean, yeah. the, the bottom line is all of these things, in my view, are net positive for our investment thesis. Mm -hmm. And it's ironic to me that everyone is so wedded to looking in the rearview mirror and just assuming, I mean, the five-year inflation swaps are still saying we're going back to two or 3% inflation. <laughs> I just think that's, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not a betting person on things, derivatives like that, but boy, I'd take the other side of that all day long. I just don't think we're going back to that. But, but that's why, you know, that's why the market for our stuff has been kind of punk because, you know, the average investor had done incredibly well on the other stuff, owning Apple and the, and the fangs. And, and in a deflationary environment, all the technology is an important thing. And so, you know, and if we're going back to that, well, then, you know, you really don't need these, these commodities and these resources. And, of course, those of us who read Zoltan and who study the geopolitical piece of it all, we're like, well, you know, guys, it's changed. You know? I have become a big fan of Zoltan. Yeah. Ronnie Sturfala. Just did a great yeah. summary of, of Zoltan this morning uh, yeah. that, that I retweeted. Yeah. Um, but we're getting off topic there. <laughs> um, and, you know, just one one more point on Europe. It's I'll bet you this winter, if they have a lot of problems, you know, you know, rolling blackouts, they're talking about doing, um, you know, industries, just entire industries being cut off from natural gas that wow. require it, uh, high energy consumption, factories just not being allowed to operate in Europe when unemployment goes up and people are cold or having blackouts in Europe because of the failed European energy policies particularly Germany you know I'm hopeful that you know a little bit of realism and and people figure out um what what it's necessary to have a, a rational energy policy and mm -hmm. all these fictional things of like you're, you're like seriously you're going to have that much solar in cloudy Germany I mean, come on. Yeah. It just doesn't no, it just, anyone who's just has an ounce of common sense knows Germany's never gonna have a dominant electric right. grid powered by solar energy. <laughs> it's right. Just, no. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Um, Lawrence, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. You know, everyone loves to hear from you. Your videos are always very popular. You know, you're at oh, 94, 94, 000 followers on Twitter. So You've definitely yeah, but uh, but you guys have got in the Twitter wars. You're winning. You got 250. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks, guys. It's always fun to be with you, Jim. And I really appreciate you know yours and Ivan's insights. I mean, obviously, you guys get it, yeah. and uh, you know, there's a small group of us who do get it, and we're we're trying we're gonna to. Be, we're going to be right one of these days, right? We're oh right. yeah, we are. It's broken <laughs> clock, right? Yeah. We have been right. We have been right. We just the market's you know, wrong. Just, oh! We're not. We're stages. not wrong. The market's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, markets, you know, bull markets try to throw you off. I mean, that's yeah. what Richard Russell said. And he's right. Yeah. You know, so the trick here is not to get thrown off. Yeah.